Welcome, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we are now in a huge uh, working group initiative uh, to, to to have uh, this uh, e, e seminar on uh, oral anticoagulant therapy in dialysis patient with the uh, atrial uh, fibrillation. We will have uh, a speaker, uh, very well known, Adrian Kovic uh, from. Uh, uh, Romania, sorry, uh, Professor Adrian Kovic, uh, who is a, a specialist of... Um, good uh, afternoon. Okay, good afternoon, Adrian. Uh, uh, cardiovascular complications in, in, in patients on uh, hemodialysis. We will have uh, two panelists, uh, Tatiana Polpara and uh, Mary Evans, and uh, myself, uh, Christian Combe, I'm uh, the moderator. Uh, I will uh, try to... Um, to be a, a, a middle person be, between uh, the audience and the, the speakers. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, we will have uh, the first uh, the presentation by uh, uh, Professor Kovic, and then by um, you, you will be able to ask questions. We have yet uh, some questions uh, which are open, but uh, in that time you are nearly 60. Uh, Professor Kovic uh, will do his uh, presentation. Adrian, it's up to you. Thank you, Professor Combe. Uh, um, and uh, I'm starting to share my screen. Um, I've been asked by the UDL group to discuss with the audience and with such a select uh, uh, group uh, the um, the certainties and inquiries, inquiries about uh, uh, how to uh, anticoagulate patients, CKD patients uh, with atrial fibrillation. Uh, these are my disclosures and uh, I think I would start uh, uh, this presentation by discussing a little bit by uh, the risks of uh, having uh, bleeding or ischemic risks in, uh, in CKD. And first of all, I have to say uh, a loud yes, that they, they are different from the general population. Uh, we can see that there is an increased, and we know that, there is an increased risk uh, for hemorrhagic uh, uh, events in CKD patients because of alterations in platelet synthesis, uh, composition, and activation, because of a dysfunctional platelet vessel wall interaction, uh, because of of uh, uh, reduced platelet aggregation. And let's not forget that we are discussing today about drugs and our patients, they have a lot of invasive procedures as well. At the same time, there is, there is a well-known and well-recognized increased ischemic risks. Uh, we know that uh, our patients have a, a huge um, uh, increased risk of uh, major major uh, adverse cardiovascular events of myocardial infarction, of arteriosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, and of sudden cardiac death. Uh, and all the components of the uh, well-known Virchow triad are abnormal in, uh, in uh, CKD patients. Um, so at the same time, we have a, a perfect storm. We have an increased ischemic risk, and we have a, a, a huge bleeding risk in our patients. So some of these patients will have also atrial fibrillation. And I have to say, I'm not uh, showing this at, at this time, but uh, uh, there have been numerous publications showing that uh, the incidence and the prevalence of uh, atrial fibrillations, atrial fibrillation are highly increased in CKD patients. And uh, uh, those numbers are increasing uh, with the increasing CKD state. Now, the question, the one million pound question is uh, if the risk for stroke is increased in these patients, similar to the general population. And um, the first answer would be yes. First of all, uh, we see that there is a, a shorter time to event, a shorter time to stroke in uh, uh, hemodialysis patients with the, with the atrial fibrillation. And at the same time, if we uh, stratify the patients by the CHAS uh, uh, 2 score, um, then higher the CHAS score, 
um, the shorter the time to throw there is. And there is a, a larger, uh, more, more uh, recent publication. You can see that uh, this is a publication uh, including 56, uh, 700 and something patients. Um, and uh, in this publication, the author actually were able to dissect a little bit more the risk for stroke. And they showed that only the risk for ischemic stroke is increased by 26%. And this is the, um, the um, uh, interval of confidence. Uh, however, the risk for hemorrhagic stroke is not increased, uh, significantly increased in this patient. So a nuance, if you, if you would like. At the same time, there are some other studies showing uh, the opposite, that the atrial fibrillation would not increase the risk uh, for stroke in hemodialysis patients, and that would be completely different from the general population. I have to say that these studies are smaller, as you can see. Uh, for example, this is a, a, a barely 380 non-anticoagulated hemodialysis patients uh, divided by atrial and non-atrial fibrillation. Um, and I have to say that there is a, a, a trend, uh, the curves are uh, divergent, but they do not reach significance, uh, statistical significance, maybe because the study is small. This is a, a, a larger study, but not a very large study uh, compared to what we are accustomed in the cardiological background. This is a, a really small study, and here the curves are actually uh, perfectly superimposable. Now, on top of that, we do not have good tools. Um, and this is a, a recent publication, as you can see, uh, it is in 2021 in the leading European uh, cardiological journal. And they uh, looked at uh, the, uh, the different risk scores for ischemic stroke and uh, in atrial fibrillation across the spectrum of kidney disease. This is the um, visual abstract of the publication and uh, the author evaluated six scores. Uh, and they are listed here, and uh, the population was, uh, as I've said, a, a, a typical cardiological population, more than 36,000 patients. And in fact, what they showed is that um, uh, in the most uh, clinical relevant stages of CKD, the predictive performance of majority of risk scores was rather poor. And in fact, it was uh, associated with uh, the high risk of misclassification. And because of that, it was leading to either over or under treatment. And the only score which was sort of uh, better performing than the others was the modified CHATS uh, 2 score, uh, which was performing better across all uh, uh, various of kidney function strata. <clears throat> this is the modified score, but in fact, uh, let's go to our real life patients, uh, our typical dialysis patients, and I'm happy that I'm addressing a, 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 a panel of, uh, of specialists and a lot of experts in um, which are now with us. And if you look at the, uh, this score, nearly all our dialysis patients would qualify, qualify for, for uh, a high risk score because um, the typical incident dialysis population is more than 70 because all of our patients will have vascular disease because hypertension is almost ubiquitous because a third percent will have congestive heart failure and so on. So in fact we need a, a better score and I think this is one of the probably the leading area of research which we, we should undertake. This is one of the proposed maybe changes and as you can see there is a higher uh, weight uh, for having a stroke, a prior ischemic stroke um, and uh, uh, there is a minus one uh, weight for having uh, intestinal bleed in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, period of time. 
let let me move to the second part and in the second part uh would uh, I, I i'm going to try to ask uh, to answer to the question uh, if anticoagulation in dialysis patient with atrial fibrillation is mandatory and in fact uh, i have to start answering this question by two statements first that there is clearly a large evidence gap in the approach to reduce thromboembolic risk in, in dialysis patients with atrial fibrillation. Second, there is a large practice variability, and because of that, there is a lot of physician uncertainty. We do not have good tools, as I've showed you. Uh, we have, I'm going to discuss with you, various guidelines, maybe contradicting guidelines, but also we, we uh, have a lot of variability in practice. To try to sort of uh, dissect through this variability, uh, this is, uh, I was lucky to have So the, the strength of, of the evidence uh, available for direct uh, comparisons. Um, and then uh, the italic number means that the uh, number of study arms between the two strategies. Um, there is a fairly uh, large amount of studies, uh, more than 70,000 patients, and they looked both of the risk of stroke and the bleeding uh, situation in these patients. Um, as you can see, there is a primary efficacy endpoint looking at stroke and thromboembolism, and there is a safety endpoint as well looking at bleeding. Uh, most of the studies were observational studies, in fact, in this, in this publication. And the first important, uh, the first important um, um, a result of this publication is if we look at the apixaban uh, a, a leading DOAC as experience and varfarin, there is no difference between uh, the risk of stroke, uh, the risk of uh, systemic thromboembolism compared to no anticoagulants. So um, the answer would be rather no here. Uh, maybe apixaban in, uh, in a higher dose uh, twice daily um only that is associated with a lower risk of mortality in comparison to the no anticoagulant strategy uh, also and rather reassuring there was no difference in the bleeding risk with uh, with such a dose of apixaban whereas on the other hand and i think this is important either with varfarin and please uh, bear in mind or uh, please uh, make a note that uh, this is the larger body of evidence uh, and also with some other uh, DOACs, uh, here the risk of bleeding is actually uh, favoring the uh, anticoagulation compared to no anticoagulation. So actually the author concluded that uh, the OACs were not associated with a lower risk of thromboembolism in patients with atrial fibrillation on chronic dialysis. Uh, maybe apixaban 5 milligrams would be um, the anticoagulant to look at. Uh, and clearly, uh, varfarin and some of the other DOACs uh, uh, are also ineffective and risky because they are associated with higher bleeding risk compared with no anticoagulation. Now, let me remind you that, in fact, we, we are dealing with two clearly different types of population. We are dealing with uh, CKD 3 and 4, and even here that there are differences between 3, which is rather normal, and 4, 5, which is close to dialysis, and the dialysis population. And I think this is relevant for our discussion because if we only look at the dialysis population, uh, you can see in this other very recent population uh, and study published in 2021 in AJKD, um, the in dialysis patient, the 
oral anticoagulants uh, would increase the risk of bleeding events without any significant beneficial event versus no anticoagulant. So I would conclude and I would uh, uh, finish my second part of uh, the presentation by saying that, in fact, uh, we do have some evidence-based conclusion by now, not strong, not class 1A, but uh, there is accumulating evidence that uh, dialysis patients with atrial fibrillation should not routinely, and I think the important point is routinely, receive oral anticoagulation. Because to date, no study has clearly demonstrated that there is a protection ag against stroke, and the bleeding risk from several lines of evidence is actually worrisome and I think it's a danger. Now, <clears throat> let's look a little bit more to the, uh, uh, to the to warfarin and to VKAs. And the point here, which I clearly want to underline, is this to me is an outdated therapy in dialysis patients. Um, and I'm going to answer why. This, first of all, in this quite large uh, investigation, uh, and this is published in JAMA. Um, I, I would like to, to make a note here and to make a point that uh, we see a lot of uh, important uh, evidence coming from non-renal journals. Uh, and I think this is relevant for the, for, the, for the discussion as well. You can see this publication in JAMA looking at nearly 50,000 patients with end-stage renal disease or undergoing dialysis. So not only dialysis patients that, first of all, VK, vitamin K antagonists did not reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. There was a significantly increase in, in hemorrhagic stroke, so not prevention but risk. Um, Altogether, they did not reduce the mortality, so almost uh, crossing the line of identity. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, in this other study, uh, which is a, a, a huge meta-analysis, as you can see, 15 cohort studies uh, with 17 plus thousand Varfarin users, uh, with the primary outcome of bleeding risk associated with warfarin use, there is uh, a huge increase in, uh, in uh, bleeding with this patient. So, ineffective, more hemorrhagic stroke and more bleeding risks. And it's not a trivial bleeding risk, because if we look here at the bleeding sites, you can see that the intracranial bleeding is actually significantly increased. So we are, for those who are still promoting and still proposing that we should maybe use warfarin, let's not forget that the evidence is really quite solid, showing that there is no um, favorable effect and there is only a risk of a major intracranial bleeding and I think this is relevant. On top of that, nephrologists uh, have shown that long-standing, long-lasting warfarin treatment is associated with a hugely increased risk of calcification and uh, there is calcification everywhere. Uh, the carotid plaque, uh, as assessed by, uh, by, uh, by various techniques, but also warfarin is the leading cause of, uh, uh, of promoting and having calcifylaxis, uh, which is the uremic particular arteriolopathy, uh, calcific arteriolopathy in our patients. So to me, this is a dead, completely dead end, and I would rather be interested to hear uh, as well the point of view of my fellow discussants and panelists today. Let me now move to and talk a little bit uh, uh, about DOACs. Here, if we move uh, to the non-renal guidelines, we see that uh, 
uh, there are different and various guidelines. This is the guideline published in 2019 in circulation, let's say the American guideline, um, which in fact uh, will focus on the management of patients uh, uh, with various kinds of atrial fibrillation, promoting uh, DOACs. Um, and here is the European guideline, in fact, uh, uh, showing that if you are a, a dialysis patient or an end stage renal disease patient or close to the end stage renal disease, uh, you would rather not use the DOACs. So two major guidelines, two non-renal guidelines uh, discussing various things. So this is why, together with a, a colleague of mine, similarly cardiologist with me and with a famous cardiologist from the US, Peter McCulloch, we actually uh, uh, promoted the role of cardionephrology and um, we clearly said that physicians have too many contradictory, sorry for the mistake, guidelines. And I think that there is, I'm making a call to arms. There is time maybe for UDL, for the ERA, to sort of uh, uh, try to together steam with uh, at least European colleagues, cardiologists, fellow cardiologists, to have a common language and to see what we, uh, we, are, we think about DOACs. Why would we promote or we would consider DOACs uh, in these patients? And, and this is another publication with the part of the UDL group. Uh, uh, together with um, with uh, Alberto Ortiz, uh, at that time editor in chief of, uh, of CKJ, and uh, the pros and cons are listed here. Maybe better efficacy, maybe reduced bleeding risks. Uh, but as I've shown you in the cons, um, uh, there are differences in uh, in the various uh, in the various guidelines. This is a publication which is again quite recent, and in this publication, uh, the author looked uh, in, a, in a retrospective cohort from Medicare beneficiaries. So it was from the US RDS. They looked at the risk of stroke, uh, the mortality risk, and the bleeding risk. And um, this is a lower quality evidence, first of all, um, but in this uh, lower quality, rather large evidence, um, uh, the direct comparison with warfarin was positive, and you can see here uh, both with the apixaban of 2.5 and apixaban of 5. Um, may I remind you the data from the network meta-analysis that the apixaban of 5 was, was okay um, and the apixaban both of 5 and 2.5 were not associated with uh, more bleeding. So, in fact, uh, apixaban would be the solution. I can't say that. Oh, because after that study in 2018, uh, which was from a retrospective USRDS cohort, uh, in CJSON another USRDS uh, retrospective cohort was published. Um, this is with a lower number of apixaban, uh, but this time the patients were actually matched, very well matched with patients not treated with uh, any anticoagulant patients. So, uh, in the in the previous in the previous analysis from the USRDS, it was a comparison with warfarin, and uh, some critics would say that maybe there was a difference because warfarin is bad, and when you compare something with some, with a comparator which is bad, maybe maybe you are going to have a, a positive result here. The apixaban both 5 and 2.5 were compared with no anticoagulation and I am underlining again uh, that uh, there was a, a, a rather good negative issues, uh, no efficacy, uh, there is a, a, an increased risk of uh, intracranial bleeding and uh, furthermore uh, in the lower apixaban uh, uh, dose or dosage, there was a higher rate, rate of uh, MI and ischemic stroke. 
So I think uh, that we do not have yet an answer and we do not have an answer even from uh, European studies looking at other dogs because this was published uh, from a, a leading research European group and here the idea was uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, there was a direct comparison between uh, Rivaroxaban and uh, Warfarin. And second, uh, they wanted to prove uh, that the calcification impact of vitamin K antagonists would be mitigated by Rivaroxaban. Um, here the study is, uh, let's say, rather positive. Um, so a new hope, but uh, in the previous uh, uh, data, uh, there was more cautious when we discussed about Rivaroxaban. Maybe we'll see the answer in the next iteration of this presentation because there are some studies. I'm here showing you the number uh, of the studies uh, uh, which are ongoing and I think we will have a more definitive answer. In the next final two steps, I'm going to discuss two other relevant points. So by now we are a little bit gloomy about how to anticoagulate our patients. Do we have alternatives to that? Um, and uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm referring to the cardiology uh, perspective, uh, we have the left atrial appendage occlusion. And that this is a relevant point because maybe not so relevant or uh, for the nephrological uh, community. May I remind you to my fellows nephrologists that uh, the vast majority of events are coming from uh, thrombi which are formed in the left uh, atrial appendage. So this is why this technique was promoted and it clearly earned a place in the guideline uh, in the guideline uh, world. Also in dialysis patients there as you can see there is a role for left atrial appendage occlusion and this was published by Simonetta Genovese and uh, I urge you to actually to read this uh, uh, this publication it is uh, very recent it is published in a in an increasing uh, uh, increasingly uh, well recognized uh, uh, European journal journal of nephrology um, and they showed that uh, the mortality the number of cardiovascular events and the bleeding profile are favorably influenced by by uh, by this technique so i think that this technique is to be considered but at the same time i think um, uh, uh, we have to be careful and um, uh, i uh, uh, immediately after that paper i went to my colleague uh, which is the head of the interventional department in uh, in the regional institute of cardiology my colleague uh, dr bulaku and asked his for his opinion and i and he has, his answer was a little bit more muted because indeed this is a solution, but it has to be performed by skilled operators. It has to, we have to look at the at the patient selection. You really need an extended heart renal team with close follow up, and there is a lot to be discussed about about the post procedural antithrombotic regimen. And I think this last point is actually very important because it leads to my my last point and in my last point i'm going to show you the most difficult pain and uh, in, in uh, also an acute or a chronic coronary syndrome these patients if we look again at the uh, at the cardiological uh, guidelines non-renal gui guidelines you will see that they they are treated by uh, the so-called triple uh, 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 triple regimens. In triple regimens, we have an oral anticoagulant, and then we have aspirin, and we have all another uh, direct inhibitor of uh, the platelet uh, side of the coagulation. The difference is related to the fact if there is an acute coronary syndrome or a chronic coronary syndrome, and then it is related to uh, to the length of the triple therapy 
continued by the length of the dub doubled therapy. Cardiologists will also have a discussion about what uh, component of this triple therapy to use. Should we use this in our patient or in a patient with a, with a left uh, atrial appendage occlusion after the procedure? What should we use as antithrombotic? And here again, we have a, a, another publication on behalf of the, of the uh, UDL group. Um, and in this, this is a, let's say, expert opinion. We voted on this. We actually suggested to divide patients by the uh, risk assessment. And we were assessing what is prevailing, the bleeding risk versus the ischemic risk. And as you can see, if the bleeding risk is very high, the, the uh, recommendation by the panelists was no triple uh, therapy. Uh, just use uh, oral anticoagulation uh, plus something else uh, for 12 months. If the ischemic risk is uh, the one prevailing, uh, then uh, uh, triple therapy could be looked at. Uh, but be aware of uh, the uh, amount of triple therapy or double therapy uh, and maybe we should uh, discuss that and we don't know and maybe this is a, a point to be discussed by the panelists. Uh, the worst is to be in between because here uh, we don't know really. Maybe triple therapy for one month, maybe then double therapy for a smaller amount of time um, so just guesses and really you should look at the patient, individualize uh, the treatment and have a, a perfect heart renal team. So these are my take home messages. Uh, you should, we should try to use dedicated clinical tools for ischemic and hemorrhagic risks assessments. Uh, and uh, we have to say that those are currently exhibiting a poor performance for dialysis patients. There is absolutely clear a large evidence gap in the approach to reduce thromboembolic risk in hemodialysis patients, which led to a large practical variability and physician uncertainty. Um, clearly, not all dialysis patients should routinely receive oral anticoagulation. Clearly, at this time, I am against using a vitamin K antagonist. Um, we, we are not clear about DOACs. Uh, as you can see, uh, both the European uh, uh, guidelines are not recommending that. Uh, we are not clear if a Pixaban is uh, five milligrams would be the one to use. Maybe light at the end of the tunnel is coming. Um, I think that um, uh, using left uh, uh, occlusion appendages devices is actually uh, to be considered. And uh, we should also look at uh, how uh, we uh, uh, triple therapy our patients. And really thank you for uh, the attendance and uh, I'm very much looking for uh, the questions. Christian and uh, my dear friends, it's up to you now. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Adrian. This was uh, really a splendid uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, the only problem is uh, that if uh, if uh, some people came with, uh, um, you know, definitive views, uh, they have lost them <laughs> because uh, the level of uh, uncertainty is uh, quite, uh, quite high. And uh, I think that, um, you, you know, the, the different guidelines uh, the different results are really uh, well. I, I think it's uh, uh, questioning all uh, all participants. Uh, we have more than uh, seventy members. I have looked uh, at the the list of uh, participants. We have uh, the boss of the UDL group uh, who is watching us, uh, Dr. Car Carlo Basile. We have uh, Francesco Locadelli and uh, 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 other people who have. Uh, a very, uh, who know this uh, very well. Um, so we, we have uh, questions uh, that uh, that have been uh, asked by, uh, well, before the, the presentation, but some of them, um, well, it will be difficult to answer them in the way that people ask them. 
Uh, for instance, the second question is, are there any differences when deciding on uh, introducing all anticoagulant treatment in hemodialysis patients compared to non-dialysis patients, especially in the patients uh, uh, older than 80? And I, I think you have uh, answered that, but uh, yeah. Frankly, uh, yes. I think that uh, there is a higher risk of bleeding in in these older patients. Um, and I think uh, similarly to uh, the approach to uh, hypoglycemia and controlling uh, uh, diabetes, we should assess risks and frailty in these patients. So, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, also the expectant life expectancy, because uh, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, it's too much in, in such patients, but Uh, I would uh, be interested to see the panelists. Tatiana, Mary. Um, <clears throat> thank you. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for the uh, excellent review of the lack of evidence in management of patients on dialysis and those having uh, additionally atrial fibrillation. They are really a challenging population, uh, high risk population, uh, slightly predominated, I would say, by the concerns about bleeding risk. The ischemic risk is rather high, but bleeding risk parallels uh, ischemic risk all the time in almost all patients. And this is why formal guidelines from the learned societies cannot really produce uh, formal um, recommendations which need to be evidence-based. And uh, we lack uh, uh, high quality evidence. This is, if you look at recommendations, if any, at informal guideline documents, you will see that they are mostly a class to B level of evidence, B or even C, and then it's reserved for ex uh, expert consensus uh, documents where a formulation of suggestions and recommendation can be more liberal based on expert opinion. And your presentation was also, also uh, thought provoking for me because um, if you look at uh, the, the effects of oral anticoagulant therapy in patients on dialysis, maybe we should stop looking at ischemic stroke risk reduction and change our view and look for another hard outcome, such as, for example, mortality, because we all know that oral anticoagulant mm -hmm. therapy reduces mortality risk as well, and that, that there is a significant reduction. Or we should look at uh, uh, composite or net clinical benefit analysis. And another major point that I would like to stress out, uh, European AF guidelines from 2020 uh, strongly introduced a patient-centered management of atrial fibrillation. So I think that, um, uh, that we need to individualize decision-making in every single patient, also accounting for patients' personal uh, values and preferences, and the decision about using oral anticoagulant therapy needs to be shared with patient or patient carer. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. There, there is a question where, uh, which relates uh, to that. Um, if a CKD patient is already on uh, VKF or atrial fibrillation and CKD progresses, and the patient has to go on dialysis, would you actively discontinue a vitamin K, K antagonist? Uh, I, personally, uh, again, I would love to say what uh, Marie uh, thinks or Tatiana, uh, but yes, personally, yes. yes. And this is what we are currently doing in our uh, cardiorenal team, because I think that there are a lot of uncertainties. Uh, this is true. But I think uh, the evidence against vitamin K is, is rather strong. So uh, I would be reluctant to start a patient, but if the patient is already on an oral anticoagulant, as the question is there, uh, clearly I would choose the one with less, uh, the less 
minuses. So this is currently what we are doing. Uh, if the patient is on vitamin K, we are changing uh, the patient. But uh, to start, that's another point. But so, uh, Mary, where, what's your opinion? So thank you again for uh, for this very nice presentation. I, and I, I was um, uh, also very um, I was very pleased to hear your rather um, uh, that you pinpointed the the lack of evidence of uh, warfarin in hemodialysis patients treated uh, with atrial fibrillation, and I think this is. It's rather a, a, a quite large um, misconception today still that we need to, to treat patients with, with warfarin um, if they have atrial fibrillation. Sure. So I was recently discussing with, I had the possibility to discuss this with, with some other colleagues from other countries and, and um, the people told me that, um, or the ex expression that I, um, that I received, or the impression that I received, was that uh, they believed that it was unethical to uh, not to treat the patients with anything. Um, and this might be true if we compare with DOAX, but still the evidence speaks, uh, we don't really know whether, um, whether any oral anticoagulation is effective. Uh, so in Sweden, we did an, an investigation on how many patients were actually treated with warfarin. And we found that less than 10% of our hemodialysis patients were treated with, with oral anticoagulation. And, and we have virtually no patients with on DOAX uh, because of the limitations of the reimbursements and um, the current guidelines. Um, in CKD stage five, uh, on the other hand, we have about 30, 35% of the atrial fibrillation patients were treated with, with uh, predominantly warfarin. So um, uh, we are not treating the patients and we, um, uh, but we do, I think the, uh, uh, there is um, um, always a big debate um, and, um, and this issue needs to be sort of um, raised more of the lack of evidence. Uh, another thing that I uh, sort of um, think that you pinpointed in your presentation was, was really um, the interaction with the uh, antiplatelet therapy. Uh, because we know that the antiplatelet therapy uh, in combination with the oral an anticoagulation, it also might sort of enlarge the risk of bleeding. And I think that is not, um, not so well understood. Absolutely, absolutely clear. Uh, uh, we looked at the, uh, from another point of view, uh, we asked our colleagues uh, uh, in the gastroenterological department to uh, see how many of the emergency admissions for uh, uh, an important GI bleed, um, how many of them were on various drugs, um, and 100% uh, were uh, on uh, antiplatelet and warfarin uh, or uh, a DOAC. So I think that uh, this is a huge risk uh, in some of our patients. Um, let's not forget that many uh, physicians are promoting some sort of athlete, uh, therapy for the fistula. Um, so uh, again, we are going to, to run into all sorts of uh, interactions of, uh, of these drugs. Uh, okay, um, yeah, there, are, um, there are questions uh, that are of uh, medical uh, nature, but uh, do, do you think that uh, uh, legal actions uh, could be uh, taken uh, for from uh, the family of a patient, for instance, if we don't give uh, any anticoagulant to a patient with uh, atrial fibrillation. I'm uh, rather convinced that uh, there will be some uh, uh, cardiologist uh, expert um, who will say this man should have been on uh, anticoagulant. And um, it, it will be quite uh, difficult, uh, you know, the, the balance between uh, uh, medicine and, uh, and law. What's your opinion? 
I think I think this is a very tough uh, point. Um, uh, but I think that uh, uh, for sure it, the, there's going to be some sort of uh, here and there legal battles. Um, but in my presentation, this is why I actually underline the fact that uh, the evidence is um, uh, contradictory even in the cardiological mm -hmm. world. Um, I've shown you the US and the European evidence. Also, one of my important points, I think, uh, is to uh, it, it is time to maybe to make consensus uh, groups or working groups between uh, us and cardiologists, at least in, in Europe, and maybe to have some consensus documents which uh, will both. Uh, uh, foster uh, research, uh, reporting, and I think uh, some sort of maybe, uh, I don't say legal coverage, but maybe legal background of that. Um, and we should, uh, th this can be very easily promoted by, by both sides. Yes, um, Tatiana? Thank you. Thank uh, you. Well, I think that really um, uh, presently, given the available body of evidence and the formulation of the formal guidelines from the learned societies, it is difficult to make a case uh, from not treating a patient with AF on dialysis, because if you look at the, the formulation of recommendations, they are, they are all can be, maybe, it's not even should be. Uh, mm -hmm. Then uh, the, the only case could be made, in my view, uh, if the patient expressed a strong preference towards having oral anticoagulant therapy to avoid stroke and was not, uh, was not given one uh, after informing the patient about the risk of bleeding. Yes, uh, I totally agree. There is a question by uh, Dr. John Nickel. Uh, can you tell how we can mitigate the risk of bleeding in patients with CKD who are on a VKA? or no accent who are also using a uh, heparin during dialysis. There, there, were, there were some questions uh, about uh, heparin during uh, dialysis. Should it be uh, interrupted uh, in patients on uh, anticoagulants? So what's your, what are your answers? Marie? Um, well, I, I personally, uh, if, if I have a patient on warfarin, uh, or even DOAC uh, on hemodialysis, um, I would give um, the, the low molecular weight, um, like in a HEP um, uh, during dialysis, but we usually give it in a re reduced dose. So that is what we do. Yes, um, we have a similar protocol. Uh, so all these patients. All these patients with which are on oral anticoagulants are a uh, as means, but also on a, on a rather lower dosage. Um, and there is a note for the nurses to sort of uh, use more flushing at, uh, of the of the uh, uh, of the dialyzer of the filter. Uh, to prevent coagulation and maybe to uh, to optimize uh, this lower dosage. Um, having said that, the other, the other point is that uh, PPI, they do not work. Uh, uh, and uh, these are dialysis patients, but uh, in fact, if we go to CKD, PPI are almost like a sort of uh, uh, compulsory pill to be used with any patients, and maybe they are continuing to or promoting uh, a CKD progression. So uh, I, I don't think that PPI are the solution to do that. Um, other questions? I don't know if you can hear me. Yes? Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, if the patient has uh, heart valve insufficiency and uh, atrial fibrillation and he has been going on uh, dialysis, well, well, friend, it's very hard to titrate what you will uh, suggest doing. 
Uh, I think the, the, the question of uh, anticoagulation in patients who have a prosthetic valve is quite different from uh, atrial fibrillation. Yeah, but uh, if I understood the question well, the question mm -hmm. is referring to the disease of the native valve, yes. uh, a yes. valve insufficiency. Yeah, the was, uh, there was uh, uh, the was use, the yeah. yes, the use of uh, 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 non vitamin K oral antagonist drugs is not really prohibited in such patients. There is a sort mm -hmm. of confusion because mm -hmm. of the terms valvular and non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Actually, what we, and we, we tried to resolve that in the latest DSC guidelines. Uh, NOAX should not be used in patients with prosthetic heart valves and those with significant rheumatic mitral stenosis in all other valvular diseases, diseases of native valves, there is no reason not to use a NOAC and not warfarin. So switch to NOAC if patient is eligible for oral anticoagulation at all. Thing is, these kind of patients are a perfect example of, first of all, why you need a cardiorenal team because they are highly specialized, highly selected. Um, and also, these, these are more close to, let's say, to the legal challenge. That I think this is a good example why the, the legal part is, is important. Here is the, the legal part is important in a, in, a, in a team. Yes. Let me... So, the, there's a, another question on, on the, in fact, um, the... When patients are on uh, stage five and uh, choose not to dialyze, uh, then um, what matters most, uh, dialysis or CKD stage five in the uh, in the risk of stroke? Uh, I think uh, there are answers. Uh, maybe from uh, Sweden, Mary, since you have a nice uh, registry of uh, CKD patients uh, in Sweden. Yes, I mean, we actually did a publication, an observational publication, where we compared warfarin to no treatment in CKD different stages. And we found that there was a, an advantage with oral anticoagulation in stage five dialysis or in stage five patients, but with, we didn't know whether they were on dialysis or not. Um, but this was only an observational study, um, and we mainly looked, on, uh, looked at mortality. Uh, so, um, so I think that the stroke risk is actually quite elevated in, in CKD stage five, but um, regardless of, of, of the elevated stroke risk, you still need to, to assess the patient risk because the risk of bleeding is also increasing by CKD stage. Mm. So, and, and also you need to consider that the DOACs are not recommended in stage five, regardless of whether they are on uh, oral anticoag, um, regardless of whether they are on dialysis or not, uh, they are not recommended according to the, uh, to the drug uh, agencies. Um, so um, you, you're still left with the decision, there is no evidence, uh, and you have to, to make a personalized choice for your patient uh, and looking at the risk. Uh, I think the, this is a, an excellent conclusion of uh, all our questions. That, that is an individualized uh, assessment of risk of uh, indication, uh, also of the, um, of the, the dose, uh, etc. And uh, there is no uh, single answer to, to the question of uh, anticoagulation in patients on uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, I, uh, I hope that you agree with me. Okay. Yes. Uh, maybe Adrian or Tatiana or Mary, you would like to say something, something more? I, I think that uh, your point was perfect, uh, uh, that we should individualize. And I would only underline the, uh, also the last point by Marie, uh, that dialysis patients are completely different from CKD. Uh, even stage five. So I think uh, um, we have three different categories of patients 
uh, four or five dialysis and all the others which should be treated as uh, as normal normal people okay and thank you so uh, thank you to all panelists uh, adrian your presentation was uh, a really a uh, fantastic one uh, i have enjoyed it uh, it was an honor for me to be a moderator and uh, i think we can close now and i remind uh, the audience that uh, November the 2nd, CKD MBD group, but we will have uh, other seminars uh, from our group. Bye-bye.